Hey again, everybody. I'm Paul Rabelais. Welcome to Estate Planning Live again. Got a big topic to today, which is about protecting your home and your life savings from nursing home expenses. So it's its own little niche in the estate planning area. Some people call it elder law, but it's a big concern. It's a concern for kind of the middle class. Um, and so before we get into it, though, let's go through some of our estate planning live kind of rules. Uh, if you're a channel subscriber, feel free to post a comment in the chat or a question. The way I'll do it is I present some content. We're going to go about 30 minutes. I'll present some content. I'll look at the chat. Uh, be, be great if your questions today really revolve around this idea of Medicaid and long-term care and nursing homes because estate planning is such a broad area. I'm focused in on this Medicaid issue and it's tough to, you know, to ask me, you know, a question like, Paul, my, my dad died and my stepmother took all the Tupperware uh, collection out of my dad's house. What do I do? That's not really focused to the topic of the day. But um, anyway, so we'll try to keep it on point. But nonetheless, I'm going to glance at the chat. Hey, Susie. Uh, hey, Lisa. Hey, Renee. Um, North Carolina. We got some Illinois. Thank you, Lisa, for your comment. All right. So feel free to contribute to the chat. Um, keep your chat positive, keep the comments positive, uh, and just know that I'm not giving you any one-on-one -on -one legal advice. I'm not forming any kind of a attorney client relationship with you, but I'll, I look forward to sharing the information with you. Okay. So the problem is out there that nobody knows what their future healthcare needs and their future healthcare expenses will be. You may, if, if you're, you know, on Medicare, you know, 65 years or older, you, you may feel secure knowing that Medicare covers the most of the health and hospitalization um, expenses that you have. A lot of people, but not everybody, knows that Medicare doesn't cover any of the kind of long-term skilled care and nursing home facilities when someone goes into a nursing home or a skilled care facility. Yes, if they're in the hospital for a certain number of nights and they go from the hospital to the nursing home for rehabilitation, Medicare pays for a limited number of days. But hey, Ann from Long Island, New York, uh, good to have you here. But in, but really, Medicare doesn't cover any of those long-term uh, skilled care costs. A lot of people confuse nursing homes with either assisted living facilities that also have some independent living with it. All the independent living for senior citizens, all of the assisted living for senior citizens or for anyone, that's all private pay. No, no Medicaid uh, uh, recipients there. They're all those people in assisted living. They're writing a check every month or doing a bank draft for, and they're covering their own expenses. But when it gets to nursing home care, some of the people in nursing homes qualify for Medicaid. Medicaid covers that expense. But others and many others have to pay for that expense kind of out of their own pocket. Now, the rules do vary by state. The big picture is the, the federal government makes the rules. They allow the states to administer their own Medicaid program as long as they follow within the guidelines of what, um, what Congress has, has created from a Medicaid rule standpoint. Hey, Lynn from New Hampshire. Seems like we've got a lot of North Northeast kind of people here today. Um, all right. But before we get into it, um, in reality, what I seem to do with folks is I seem to talk more people out of trying to structure their estate so they qualify for Medicaid. I seem to talk more people out of it than talk or or help people qualify for Medicaid. And, you know, when this thing goes up live and the recording goes up, um, I'm going to post a, a link to a video that I made. I think if you're seriously considering trying to structure what you have so you don't lose money if you go into a nursing home. There's a there's a place for that for sure. I've helped a lot of people do it. But I also made a video about, uh, it was called Nine Reasons Not to Protect Your Assets from the Nursing Home. So I'll post that link, but, but real quick, um, it's usually a combination of these reasons why one shouldn't try to engage in the, in the activities that I'm a, about to talk about that people do engage in. But here's some reasons why why people perhaps should consider not trying to protect their assets from the nursing home. Number one is their estate's too large. All this I'll go into, I went into and in, I went into in the video um, in much more depth. State's too large. Um, you can't protect your income. 
while many people will protect their assets if they have significant income, that's you really can't protect that. Third reason, sometimes people say their family won't put them in the nursing home. Fourth reason, uh, you have to relinquish some control to engage in Medicaid planning. Fifth reason, you might qualify for Medicaid anyway without even taking any action. We'll talk about that in a moment. Another reason, um, some people have ethical concerns with Medicaid planning. Some people say, well, if I have resources, I should really spend them rather than try to protect them and have the government pay for my care. Another reason, some of you have too large an IRA to try to engage in Medicaid planning. Another one is um, nursing home care really is not that good. And so some people deserve to get better care. They can pay for that. So I just wanted to introduce you to a few reasons why many people actively choose to not engage in Medicaid planning. With that being said, let's talk about some of the nursing home expenses. I would love if any of you on the on the call right now, looks like there's 56 of you listening right now. If you're very familiar with the actual nursing home expenses in your city, in your state, throw that into the chat. I don't want to be the sole source of that. All I know is when I looked up a little while ago, um, Genworth, an insurance company, did a survey in 2021, and they said that the average nationwide, and I real this, realize this is just an average in some places, probably uh, in your area and in Long Island, New York, and in other places, it's much higher, and in other places, it's much lower, but the average monthly uh, expense for private room care in a nursing home, $9,034 a month. Semi-private, $7,908 per month. So you could imagine if you have a married couple and and they both go into that hospital, uh, that nursing home together and they're both paying the semi-private room rate, they're going to be shelling out on average about $16,000 a month. That can drain the savings pretty quick. All right. Uh, let me jump in here. Do any uh, good legal contacts in Northern Virginia for setting up Will and Estate? Also, how do we get long-term care? Hey, Virginia music lover, what I would suggest you do, you can build it for free at an online platform that I created, self-directed. It's called myadvocate.com. When I get around to it this evening as I'm editing the video, I'll put the link in the description below. You can check that out. Uh, you can build it. And there's really no expense. And that expense can be anywhere from a couple of hundred dollars to a few hundred dollars. That expense isn't taken care of until you're ready to kind of print out the documents and sign. But it's a great exercise, myadvocate.com, for you to set up that will or trust. Hey, uh, Dave in Tucson, Georgia, my brother's credit union petitioned the court to view all bank transaction on my deceased brother's account. Would I be able to access my brother's account information? So sounds like a uh, rather unusual probate matter. There's too many specifics there that I'm not aware of. Good luck to you there, Georgia. Laura, worst care in nursing homes since COVID. I'm not a big fan of, of nursing homes either. I know that they're owned and operated and staffed by people who are doing the best they can, but it's just a tough situation. Uh, Laura, nursing homes are tough. Dave, my dad is in memory care here in Tucson for 5,800 semi-private. Okay, there you go. Thanks, Dave, for that information. Tucson, 5,800 a month. And hey, uh, Powerhouse Pete One from New York. And last one here before I jump back in, Kelsa or uh, Valdez, do you know a good lawyer here in South Jersey for giving me or help me to do a proper will or trust? Thanks. Don't have the contacts in New Jersey, but I, I built that kind of attorney experience but I built it online, myadvocate.com. Feel free to check that out. And Stephen Hay from South Texas. Okay, so we talked, we basically said it, uh, in, in most people's definitions, it's expensive to go into a nursing home. So now let's take a look at um, who has to pay for that expense, whether it's the 5,800 semi-private that Dave's father is paying, or it's more or less, how does that get paid for? So that's all based on a determination of when a person goes into the nursing home, do they qualify for Medicaid? And reality, it's kind of a, a poverty thing. If when you go into a nursing home, you are deemed impoverished according to the Medicaid rules, then Medicaid pays for those expenses. And if you're not impoverished under the Medicaid rules, you got to pony up the money every month to stay there. So in general, 
the way it works is when and and there's different rules that I'm going to get to for single people and married couple, but let's just keep it simple now and talk about the unmarried person. When the unmarried person enters a nursing home, they will qualify for Medicaid if the assets that they own are less than, generally speaking, a house, a vehicle, and another less than $2,000. If they have more than a house, a vehicle, and another $2,000, the two thousand what makes up the $2,000, things like money in the bank, stock, investments, a second home, rental property, if it's if it's uh, if it's anything more than a house, a car, and another two thousand dollars, then they don't qualify for Medicaid. Or even if they meet that threshold, if they had transferred any assets out of their name in the previous five years prior to going into the nursing home and applying for Medicaid, they're also not going to qualify for Medicaid. So the uh, people often ask, Paul, is the is the government going to take my CD that I have at the bank? Is Medicaid going to take these shares of stock that I own? Well, the government doesn't necessarily come in and just seize that stuff if you go into a nursing home. They just tell you because you own it, you're not going to qualify for Medicaid. And if you want to stay in this nursing home, we need, in Dave's case, $5,800 a month, more or less, depending upon uh where you are and what that expense is. So you're probably starting to get an idea of what are the requirements to qualify for Medicaid if you're single, house, car, and another uh, less than $2,000. If you have more than that, you won't be eligible for Medicaid. You'll pay your own way through the nursing home. Or if regardless of your assets, if you had transferred assets out of your name in the previous five years, you also will not be eligible for Medicaid. Those uh, transferred assets out of your name is called a uh, uncompensated transfer. So if you spent $40,000 on your own medical care and you spent $40,000 and you received $40,000 worth of care, that is not an uncompensated transfer. If you gave $20,000 to your granddaughter and got nothing in return, that is an uncompensated transfer. And if you did that within five years of going into the nursing home and applying for Medicaid, you won't be eligible. Or if you sold your $400,000 house to your son for $50,000, you just made a $350,000 uncompensated transfer and you won't be eligible for Medicaid if that transaction was done within the five-year period prior to going into a nursing home and qualifying for Medicaid. So it's what are your assets and have you made any uncompensated transfers in the previous five years? Okay, Lester, thanks for the information there. New York Tri-State private $13,628. Guys, you guys in New York make that average go up. Um, um, Mississippi, five to six thousand dollars monthly. Sounds uh, both of those figures sound about right. Thanks for thanks for contributing to the content here, guys, with your experience. Doodle Academy, Dad's Memory Care, $6,700 a month out of pocket, shared room in San Diego. This was five years ago. If you paid, if it was $6,700 a month five years ago, it's probably, I don't know, what is it, $8,000 today, something like that. Um, all right. And then Natalie's uh, asking Doodle a question. I like the I like the conversation between the chat members. That's uh, what I like to see. New Jersey, at least $6,000 to $7,000 a month. Um uh, Kelsa Valdez. Uh, appreciate all the contribution. Love that. All right. So um, now to make it even worse, I mentioned that you can have a home and a vehicle and $2,000. Um, and that's the single person rule. Let me go into the married and, and, and two other rules. If you're a married couple and both spouses go into the nursing home together, the rules vary slightly. So that, that couple goes into the nursing home together, they look at, again, that's double the expense. So instead of paying $7,000 a month, they're gonna be paying $14,000 a month because they're both incurring that expense um, and they have to pay for it out of their pocket unless they have less than a house, a car, and $3,000 of countable resources. So not too much of a break there. They'll get wiped out pretty quickly because they'll have to spend, you know, if they have uh, $450,000 of countable resources, um, and they're spending $15,000 a month, it's going to take about 30 months, about two and a half years for them to wipe out their life savings of $450,000, which is what they'll have to do. 
So, and then if there's this, the very common situation where you have a married couple and one spouse stays at home, that spouse is called the community spouse because they're still living in the community, has nothing to do with community property. And then you have one spouse who goes into the nursing home, that spouse is considered or called the institutionalized spouse there in the nursing home institution. Then that couple with the rationale being the one who stays at home needs something to live off of. So that couple um, can have up to a house, a vehicle and another 100 and the number is $137,400. So looking at that situation, couple uh, is at home. One of those spouses needs to go into a nursing home. That couple has a house, a car and $120,000. Well, that spouse who goes into the nursing home and is the institutionalized spouse uh, that spouse will qualify for Medicaid because of our community spouse resource allowance, which says that community spouse, that spouse who's, who's still at home, can have up to $137,400 of countable resources. So realize there's some different rules there. To make matters worse, I mentioned someone can have a home, and that home can be valued up to $636,000. It's, it's, uh, it's an exempt asset as long as the home's value does not exceed $636,000. The way home values have gone lately, geez and Pete's, um, probably going to be some, some people entering a nursing home thinking their home is, is exempt and not counted, but its value is more than $636,000. And so that's a problem. It's not exempt to the extent it exceeds that applicable limit. Again, a lot of these figures, I'm telling you, they may vary somewhat in your state um, based on what the, what the particular state has done, as long as they uh, meet those Medicaid guidelines. Okay. Um, home equity loan is the interest deductible at tax time. Uh, so Frank, yeah, I mean, uh, home equity loan interest, uh, I'm not the CPA here, but is it always deductible? I kind of got to think so. So if you got any tax CPA tax, tax gurus out there, answer Frank's question about the home equity loan interest deductible at tax time. Um, institutional person had kids under 18, special rules there. Yep. It's not common where an institutionalized spouse or someone in a nursing home has kids under 18, because most of the people in the nursing home uh, are older. You know, they're in their 60s, 70s, 80s, not very many even in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. So you're not going to see many minor children, some spe special rules there. I quite frankly have to look, at, look that up because that circumstance doesn't apply very often. But the point I wanted to make was... Um, you can have a home, a car, and either two thousand if you're single, three thousand if you're married, with both both spouses going into the nursing home, and one hundred and thirty-seven thousand four hundred if only one spouse goes into the nursing home. However, once someone goes into the nursing home, even at the point that they qualify for Medicaid, um, so let's take a single individual. They have a house worth $400,000. They have a car worth $5,000 or $10,000 or $20,000. Those are going up too. Um, and, and that single person has only $1,500 in the bank. And they hadn't made any uncompensated transfers in the previous five years. That person will qualify for Medicaid to the extent uh, that they'll, they'll have to assign their income to the nursing home. Maybe they have some Social Security income. Maybe they have some pension monthly income. And that's different from assets. Realize there's assets and there's income. Maybe they have $2,000 of monthly income and they'll have to assign that to the nursing home, less perhaps a small $38 or $40 personal needs allowance that and, and a payment for their health insurance premium. But they've got to assign the, the income to the nursing home. And then Medicaid picks up the difference between their income and the cost of the care. However, that home the way the rules are set up as far as their home goes, um, obviously that that person who goes into the nursing home, if they have a home, it's not counted. But uh, as long as there is a uh, intent to return to the home, if the person in the nursing home gets better, then that home is, is exempt. However, Medicaid has its estate recovery rights so that when that person in the nursing home dies, let's say they had spent $350,000 of Medicaid funds while that person was in the nursing home, Medicaid, Medicaid has a lien against that patient's estate, which includes the $400,000 home. So when that 
nursing home resident dies, Medicaid can exercise its estate recovery rights, which requires the house to be sold. And then Medicaid, uh, the Medicaid lien is satisfied $350,000. And then the individual's heirs get, you know, get what's left after that Medicaid estate recovery lien was satisfied. So people think the home is protected, but it really isn't. It's subject to Medicaid's estate recovery rights. Okay. So now let's talk about what, what are the strategies that some people do to try to protect what they have from the nursing homes. Uh, let's see here. Thanks for the tax deductible advice there, Imelda. Thank you. We appreciate it. And thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Um, I wish my kids will take of me and my house. I don't like to go to a nursing home. I think that's the general thought process of pretty much everyone. I, I, I don't know that I've ever talked to anyone who says, I can't wait to go to a nursing home. I'm so excited to be able to reside in a nursing home one day. I've never heard that in my 31 years of helping people. But when I talk to people, they typically say, I don't want to go to a nursing home, but you never know what the future holds. I, I might get into a condition where I don't, I don't want my kids to take care of me. I don't want to be a burden on people. So let's be realistic. I may have to go to a nursing home today, but if I do, I certainly don't want to lose everything I have. So what can we do to protect what I have just in case? All right. I uh, got a Meg from Maryland. Good to see you with the clapping hands and the, some kind of emoji, nice smiling face. All right. Um, so what do most people do who want to protect what they have? Well, since you're penalized, if you're single and you have more than a house and a car and $2,000 and you won't qualify for Medicaid if you transfer assets out of your name and make uncompensated transfers within five years prior to entering a nursing home, it might seem, seem kind of obvious that the way to qualify for Medicaid and, and quote unquote protect what you have is to get those assets out of your name at least five years before you go to a nursing home. Nobody knows what that timing's like because nobody knows when they're going to go to a nursing home. But the idea is get those assets out of your name at least five years before you go to a nursing home so that when you go into a nursing home, if you're single, you'll have less than a house, a car and $2,000 and you will have made no transfers within the previous five years. So there's your strategy. A lot more to it than that. So let's talk about some of those strategies. What does it mean to get assets out of your name? So what the, the general concept is what most people don't like is putting assets in their kids' names. Some people do it. Let me, I have the, all of this money at the bank. I have $300,000 in my checking and savings and my CDs. I'm just going to go put all that in my kids' names. Or I have this uh, investment account with $400,000. Let me just go ahead and put that in the kids' names. People are reluctant to do that, and I don't blame them. They're reluctant to do that because they don't want to give up that control. Um, and so what we see a lot is people using trusts to gain a little more control over those assets after they're transferred out of your name. Let me make a point real clear as I introduce you to transferring assets to a trust. The very common uh, probate avoidance, uh, very popular revocable living trust that's designed to avoid probate offers no protection from a, are the assets out of my name from a nursing home or Medicaid standpoint. The Medicaid rules say if your assets are in a revocable living trust, and virtually every revocable living trust says you can do whatever you want to with those assets during your lifetime. They're just titled in a way so that when you die, all of the court and attorney involved probate process is avoided. But assets in your revocable living trust still are considered countable resources for purposes of these Medicaid limits that I've been referring to. So sometimes people will tell me, Paul, I... I, you know, I set up a trust about 10 years ago, and I'm not sure if it's the, the kind that avoid that it's protected from nursing home. It probably is. And I'm like, it probably isn't. Because if it's if it was the kind of trust that protects the assets and enables you to qualify for Medicaid, that would have been the sole focus of the conversation when you set this up. You probably set up the very, very common and very, very beneficial um, revocable living trust. 
And so people oftentimes, they'll start a conversation. I want to protect my assets from the nursing home. I want to set up an irrevocable trust. But however, because some of those nine reasons apply that I'll point you to in the recording where I, where I suggest that if you meet one or more of these nine standards, you may not want to protect what you have from the nursing home. It just may not be worth it. And it may not make sense if you're, if you can put the Medicaid planning aside and you just want to make sure that things are easy for you and your spouse, if you're married, when you pass away, things go the right way to the children or the other beneficiaries, you name all the right people to be in charge, get all of your, when I can't handle stuff for myself, power of attorney stuff in place. That's the kind of stuff that if you want to go there, again, you can check the uh, myadvocate.com link that I'll link you to in the description below to get all that revocable trust set up to avoid the court and attorney involved probate. But that won't uh, kind of shield your assets because under that revocable trust, you've got total control to do whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do it with all of your assets until you pass away. All right. So going back to this, uh, to get it out of your name for nursing home purposes, you either got to really give it away and put it in your kids or other beneficiaries names or put it into a very particular type of irrevocable trust. And that irrevocable trust is, is limiting in your control. For example, under no circumstances, if you put assets in an irrevocable trust, can you be what's called a principal beneficiary of that trust under no circumstances can you just go take assets out of the trust and put them directly back into your name medicaid says if you set up a trust with that kind of power where you can just go in and put it back in your name then medicaid's going to make you exercise that power you're not going to be eligible for medicaid so oftentimes the children the beneficiaries the heirs are the the principal beneficiaries of one of these irrevocable trusts that's established for Medicaid. So uh, the idea here is transfer both those countable resources, those assets that do penalize you from being eligible for Medicaid, and in many circumstances, the home, so that Medicaid's estate recovery rights are avoided. Get all that transferred out of your name five years before you go into a nursing home. So what's the right time to start this? Who knows? A lot of people do it in their late 60s, their 70s. Uh, once you get into your mid to late 80s or 90s, a lot of people come in saying, geez, I wish I knew this. I, I wish I knew about this years ago. It's probably too late. Maybe it is or maybe it isn't. All right. Uh, let's see. And look, at this point, what I want you to do, throw, throw your experiences, if you've had any, with spouses, with parents, with grandparents, throw them into the chat. I, I want to see a lot of experiences and let everybody benefit from what you've been going through. But we've got some really good chat here. Sherry from Vegas, thank you. Ginger, my father is 80 and we live together. Should we put my name on the home with him or transfer it to me? A lot of questions there. So he's living there with you. So things going through my mind. Is that the plan for the rest of his life? Is there any circumstance where he, he may need to move out of your home and into a Medicaid facility? Um, what's the value um, of, of the home? And sounds like you're living together in his home. And so I'm going through, are there, are there other children that your father have, has that would need to be kind of factored into getting some financial benefit from your father owning this home? So a lot of stuff going on there. That's a good question. Kathy, is your primary residence exempt from Medicaid if its value is less than $893,000? Maybe $893,000 is the number in your state. In my state, the number is six hundred and thirty six thousand dollars kathy um uh you may have come on a, a few minutes after we started but or maybe you were chatting with all the others in the chat but is it is is it exempt from medicaid okay so let me be real focused on the house here or the residence your your house your home is not a countable resource meaning you can have a home if as long as it's worth less than the standard you put 893,000 i said 636,000 it's not a countable resource so you're not penalized or not ineligible from from receiving medicaid and having medicaid paid for a nursing home if you own a home however once you're in the nursing home and medicaid does start paying for your care then Medicaid's estate recovery rights exist. 
So like I said, if you spend $350,000 or Medicaid spends $350,000 on you while you're in the nursing home, Medicaid, even though your house was not a countable resource, when you apply for Medicaid, it's an asset that is part of your estate that Medicaid can pursue its estate recovery rights against. So not a countable resource, but not just uh, don't just assume that my house is definitely going to my heirs, every bit of equity in it. That's not necessarily the case because of Medicaid's estate recovery rights. How do I protect my, let's see, uh, da, 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 da. Um, Lester, transfer of assets occurred, but threat of fighting siblings is real. I think what you're getting at, yeah, it's, it's just another one of those reasons where you may not want to engage in Medicaid planning because when you engage in Medicaid planning, you better have really supportive um, children or heirs who kind of understand the comprehensive plan of we're getting assets out of our name. But you know what? If something goes awry, we're going to need everybody's participation here to maybe undo something that we did. And if you don't get that cooperation that you need, it gets ugly. Okay, how do I protect protect as how do I protect my assets from my wife and leave everything to my son? Hmm, sounds tricky. I don't think I want to go there. Um, how do I uh, how do I protect assets from my wife? Uh, just just doesn't sound right. T REM is the five year look back calendar year or by date five years ago. Very good question. So here we are. We're in May twenty twenty two. If I had transferred things in April of 2017, it's really a, a 60 month period. It's it's not a calendar year thing. It's it's 60 months. So I think that answers your question there. That's a really good question. Margo A. Largo. Uh oh, I think uh, you're not a happy camper, um, but maybe you're just a funny person. What about a limited family partnership? What about it? Sometimes people say, um, can I put my assets into an LLC? Or in your case, can I put my assets into a limited family partnership? That's getting a little, you know, the, the problem with putting assets is into an entity. I take all my assets and I put them in this family entity. If I still own the entity, then that entity that I own is a countable resource. Now, if I transfer that entity to others, the five-year period starts. And so just the, the formation of entities typically doesn't help someone qualify for Medicaid. Uh, I'm not going to go through the ladybird stuff. I'm not a ladybird expert. They're not common in my state, but good question there. I'm going to refer you to others for that. Uh, good question, Katz. Yep, uh, Natalie. So anybody who has some really good information on the ladybird deed and the state recovery, bring it on. We need We need you. We need you bad. Let's see, Stephen Hines, sounds like everybody's just trying to look how to save what they have and not be screwed by the American government. No, thanks, Stephen. You got, you got a point there. Uh, I, and uh, so the idea here is, is understand the rules, make informed decisions. Should everybody take what they have and get it out of their name? Not at all. Um, but should you educate yourself, uh, both from a Medicaid, from a tax planning, from all kinds of other things out there that could get at what you have so that you can make good informed decisions so that you're enabled to keep the control that you want to have, keep things in the family, avoid government interference, avoid difficulty, avoid delay, avoid expense, avoid bureaucracy. Yeah, I think everybody should inform themselves. And so, uh, Stephen, I think you got a good point there. Uh, LB, should I ever consider titling a safety deposit box in a bank in a revocable living trust? Yeah, I think you should. Yeah, if you're, maybe if you're incapacitated and it's in your trust, the successor trustee can jump right in and uh, kind of uh, uh, handle that asset like they would handle other assets um, that were in your revocable living trust. Colby Hawkins, I'm 21 and I've been watching some of your videos. Hey, good to see. Uh, you know, the stats show that I'm really popular among those people 65 and older. And so flattered that I am, and even more flattered that a 21-year-old has been watching my videos. Very good. Okay, so big picture here, the whole idea behind Medicaid planning. Some people ask me, Paul, when should I engage in estate planning? And I'm, you know, I'm a little crass and a little kind of, you know, when I say, eh, as long as you get it all done, you know, 30 days before you die, you're in good shape. And really, it's before you become incapacitated or you die. 
And, but with Medicaid planning and this, how do I keep, or how do I protect what I have from losing it if I go in the nursing home? Really, the answer has to be at least five years before you get yourself in that set of circumstances. Again, know that I made another video that I'm going to link you to nine reasons people shouldn't protect assets from the nursing home. So before you do take action, take a look at that. And uh, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of lawyers out there in our country that are that are kind of pushing the um, get assets out of your name, protect your assets for the nursing home, avoid nursing home poverty. I want to say kind of hold on here. There's some some circumstances where people shouldn't do that. That's what my nine reasons video is all about. OK, uh, let's see. Make sure to keep a list. By the way, on the safety deposit thing, good question there. Um, on the Medicaid application, um, it, it requires if you have a safe deposit box that a, that a, a inventory of that safety deposit box be made. Uh, because again, assets in a safe deposit box are still assets, even though they're in your safe deposit box or whether they're buried in the backyard or whatever. And you don't want to lie on a Medicaid application because that's Medicaid fraud and you don't want to be, you know, uh, 92 years old and going to jail. All right. Uh, maybe you do. Maybe, get, maybe the, the food is better there. Who knows? Uh, that was a joke. Not a good one. Does a joint checking account count as an asset? Oh, that's a question we get all the time. That's a great question. Stay tuned. Uh, listen to this answer. We get it all the time. Most of the money son put in. That's unusual. Unusual. Well, I was, <laughs> I was trying to say unusual. Winner Jim. Wim, I can't even get it right. Wimmer Jim. All right. So usually your question is not what's usual. Usually mom has a bank account. You know, it's got $100,000 in it. She adds her son as an authorized signer. Mom's social security number is on the account. Mom's social security and pension payments go into that account. We all know it's mom's money, even though son's name is, quote, on the account. Mom goes to apply for nursing home. It's all her money. Now, in your case, Wimmer Jim, most of the money son put in that joint bank account. Again, that's unusual. If you have to apply for Medicaid one day, you know, you're on that account. You may have to prove that most or all of that money is actually your son's money. So we have to look at the source of that. So they don't just look at whose names are on the account. When it's a joint account, they're like, okay, whose money is it? Prove it to us. And uh, and so you've got to do that. All right. Uh, really great questions here. You're saying a family LLC doesn't protect me from a nursing home. Not if you own the LLC, that's for sure. Because if you own a business or if you own an LLC or if you own a partnership, that ownership interest is a countable resource. Now, you can give away your ownership interest or an in LLC. It's called a membership interest. You can give that away to your, and that that's just like giving away any other asset. Hello from New York State, Ad Adina Goldsman. Is it okay that my Medicaid trust has same tax ID number as my social security number? I think what you when you open a trust account, you used your uh, personal social security number. I'd say that by itself doesn't, doesn't pose a problem. Um, but you're in New York. So check with New York. Wife has dementia. We have a revocable trust. Yeah. You probably heard me say that that doesn't offer you any nursing home protection. And, uh, you know, alarms are going off in my head because dementia is one of those reasons why people end up going to, into a nursing home. So hope that works out for the best, Scott. Stephen, we all never know. You're right. Jeffrey Cole, if my 89 year old father loaned me money for repairs to my home and charged me interest over a five or 10 year note, making monthly payments, then he went into a nursing home. Ooh, that's not good. Uh, because then if it, if it truly was a loan and he's charging you interest, then when he goes into the nursing home, he owns a note, a note receivable. You owe him money. That's an asset. And so that's a countable resource. And so that's going to make him ineligible for Medicaid. And does it help to have my son on deed as rights of survivorship? You know, a lot of people title stuff in my name with rights of survivorship to so-and-so, but it's, it's still an ownership asset of yours, but it could be a, a state issue as to whether Medicaid would have its estate recovery rights. So pay out of your pocket and all is good. Yeah. Well, you get to control what kind of care you get if you pay out of pocket. Would you have to rely on heirs to pay out of pocket costs? Maybe if, if you gave away assets and within the previous five years and you don't have them anymore, and you go to a nursing home and you're ineligible for Medicaid, Medicaid is going to say, leave this nursing home unless we get our six, seven, eight thousand dollars a month. And so 
Um, sometimes those people you transfer those assets to, hopefully it's still there because they may have to contribute back to your care until you get to the point where five years has passed since you had done those transfers. Okay, we're taking the day off tomorrow. I'll be doing a little bit of traveling tomorrow. No you, uh, estate planning live. We'll be back on Thursday, May 12th, talking all about what's called the crummy trust. Don't think of crummy as bad. It's it's uh, it's the name of someone who went through a uh, a tax court case, C-R-U-M-M-E-Y, and how we're going to start seeing that's going to be kind of the, the, the new planning method coming in um, real popular in the late 2020s and on into the 2030s. We're going to see a lot of that. I'll be talking to you about that on Thursday. Thank you so much for your chat, your comments. Feel free to keep chatting if you want to talk, uh, talk to me or talk to others. We'll see you next time.